pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, as we come together to study what your word has to say about how we should worship you, we ask that your spirit would bless us, that everything that is said and heard and received might be to your honor and glory in the building up of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Turn this morning to begin with to Hebrews chapter 12. This morning's lesson is just on Christian worship, and we will look at, uh, time permitting, the purpose, regulation, context, and essence of worship, and then we'll begin to look next time at the biblical patterns of worship and certain other aspects of it, but today more basic considerations. Worship, Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which was such that those who heard begged that no further words should be spoken to them. That's what we've not come to. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it must be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that even Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But, contrast, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels in festival array, and to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. His voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet a little while, and I will be shaking not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this expression, yet a little while, and so forth, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and fear, because our God is a consuming fire. Right? This is one of the primary passages about worship and what it is all about in the New Testament, and we will return to look at it in some detail, though not in complete detail, later on in the lesson. I said that we would talk about the purpose of worship, the regulation of worship, context of worship, and the essence of worship. First of all, let's talk about the purpose of worship. The purpose of worship is set forth for us in our shorter catechism, question one. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's man, purpose of man in every sphere of life and also, most pointedly or particularly, in worship. To glorify God and to enjoy him. First of all, what we do must be for God's pleasure, and second of all, it must be for man's pleasure or edification. Left to themselves, men seek pleasure in all the wrong things. And so the check on what true pleasure or edification is, is that things must be done first and foremost for God's pleasure, to glorify him. We glorify him through our activities, through what we say and praise and the like. In a sense, then, uh, to use the traditional analogy and one which we've used here many times, our worship service is like a dance which we perform before the throne of God for he is the spectator. He and the angelic host are the spectators of our performance. That's true in everything we do in all of life. They watch and we perform. It's true particularly in the ritual of worship, which we will look at later on. Thus, there must be a fundamental Godward orientation to worship. But secondly, and the way the catechism has it, and properly so, equally important uh, is man's edification. And we see that edification is a, a rule for worship in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, which concludes by saying, let all things be done for edification. Now, the word edification is the same, is related to our English word edifice, which means a building, doesn't it? And edification means upbuilding. We can say let everything be done for upbuilding. Edification is not synonymous with fun or stuff that we like. An immediate sensation of pleasure is not what's in mind in edification. Rather, everything that's done must be for building up the church. 
We looked last week at the three fundamental ways that God has of teaching man. Communicating information, setting up a discipline structure, and requiring patterns of worship. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. These three things are the ways that God has of communicating, uh, shaping, building, molding his people covenantally. We saw that instruction or education is not just uh, what we think of as teaching, but also in, involves inextricably the use of the sword or threats or some type of government, and also involves the ministry of the church, that is, what people are trained to do. And we'll look more at that as we go along. Worship is not natural to fallen man, so it's not always easy. It becomes easy when we become used to uh, proper patterns of worship. Worship, then, uh, must be structured, and it must be structured according to the Bible. But somebody has to set up that structure, and as we've seen, it's the officers of the church. Judges 25, 21, verse 25 says, There was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That verse can easily characterize most of what passes for Christian worship in the church today, people doing what seems good to them without any particular reference or study of what the Bible has to say and without any belief that they have to do or should do what the governors of their church set up. But this business of edifying or building up the building or the house of God is an analogy that's used throughout Scripture and is particularly used in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 to 15, which I'll read for you, where Paul says, According to the grace of God given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Now the reference here is to elders, how they build. They are the builders, and we're the stones. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man, any elder, builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's, each elder's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it's to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man, any elder's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man, any elder's work is burned up, he shall receive loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire." Then he goes on, Do you not realize that you're the temple of the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So this idea of building up, everything in worship must be done for man's edification, building up. Sometimes that's joyous. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes we hear a sermon that makes us feel just completely laid out and crucified uh, and sacrificed, and that's good. Sometimes we hear sermons that make us feel really wonderful and going out and conquering the world for Christ. Uh, all these different things uh, in worship, in the government, and in the liturgy of the church are for edification, for building up. So somebody has to set things up, and we've studied that before, and those are the overseers. In summary, then, the purpose of worship, to glorify God and to enable us to be built up to enjoy him, we have to say that our feelings must follow our actions, basic principle of psychology. We don't worship as we feel led, but as God is required. And as we do what God requires and seek to observe at least his fundamental patterns, then our feelings will follow. Now, let's move on then, since that leads us right into it, into the regulation of worship. The Bible regulates our worship. Now, what kinds of things does it talk about belong in worship? The fundamental regulation is given us, I believe, and the Reformed theologians in general will point to this, in John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In spirit and truth, then, are the two qualifying uh, marks of the regulation of worship. Now we have to ask what in spirit and truth mean, because with our backgrounds, in spirit is going to tend to mean internally, and in truth is going to tend to mean a, a system of doctrine. And neither one of those definitions is correct. They are implied, but they don't do justice to what the Bible means, either by spirit or truth. Let's talk about worshiping in truth, because that's where the regulation part will come out. And when we talk about the context of worship, the environment, we'll talk about what it means to worship in spirit, because the spirit came at Pentecost and established a new Jerusalem, and that is the environmental context spoken of here. First of all, worshiping in truth. 
Truth in the Bible, and especially in John's Gospel, means covenant faithfulness. It doesn't mean, first and foremost, uh, it doesn't mean exclusively uh, conforming intellectually to the proper doctrine. The Hebrew words which lie behind the Greek word here are the words MF, which you don't know, and the word amen, which you do know. Amen means let it be. May it be so. It is a word which is used as an oath. It's not to be shouted out in the middle of the service. It doesn't mean I feel good. Now, in some churches it does. When you say something like, oh, let's all go out and destroy paganism, people go, amen, which means I feel good. But in the Bible, amen does not mean I feel good. Amen is a solemn covenant oath. It basically means, if I don't stick with this, may I be torn in half and devoured by the birds. That's the basic covenant oath. May the Lord do so to me and more likewise, if, which means you take your robe and you rip it in half and you say, may the Lord do so to me and more, which means may the Lord rip me in half and do even worse, that is, let the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields devour my dead carcass. That's the, what the word amen means, so be serious about saying or singing amen. That's why we're careful where and at what points we say amen. It is an oath, a self-maledictory oath. Well, it means faithfulness or reliability, trustworthiness or sureness. It means confirmation. And so when Jesus says, I am the truth, he doesn't mean I am the systematic theology. He means something more than that. He means that he is the true and faithful one. He is God. Truth has to do with discipleship in John's gospel. For instance, in chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus says, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Primacy of the intellect says, If we understand the doctrine, then that's all we need. Everything else will come automatically. Well, the proof of that is simply to look at the churches that believe that and see all the great powerful impact they are making in our culture today. They're all real small. So there's got to be more to it than that, and I believe that what we said last week is what is involved in knowing the truth and abiding in the truth. It means not just knowing the doctrine, but also doing the truth. In John 3, verse 31, he who, excuse me, John 3, 21, John 3, 21. He who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifest as having been wrought in God. And 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So truth is not simply something known or communicated through teaching. It's also something practiced. It's a sphere of discipleship. And so worshiping in truth doesn't just mean having the right intellectual system. It also has to mean uh, having the right practice, having the right discipline, having the right worship. So let's look at this broader concept of truth or truth as faithfulness and talk about the regulation of worship for just a minute. We're going to get into the details of this in future lessons. But just basically, worship is a dialogue of truth. God speaks and God always speaks first. Man speaks back to God. You see that in the book of Genesis. God creates man. Who are you supposed to taught Adam how to speak? God did. God starts naming things. Then he has Adam name things. God comes from the cool of the day and says, Adam, where art thou? Adam speaks back. So the dialogue is initiated by God who always initiates everything. And God comes to man and addresses him with truth. And that truth, as we said, is an address which involves accurate information, a disciplined context, and an ordered life. And so God addresses men with information through teaching, the Bible. He addresses men through the sacraments, which show forth the death of Christ till he comes. And so this showing forth is an address from God to you. When you behold the sacraments, you see God showing himself forth. Now, we will look at this later on, but a real classic passage here is Luke 24, where the two men on the road to Emmaus, Jesus talks with them the whole time. Their hearts burn when they hear the word preached, but they don't recognize Jesus. And then he sits down, and as soon as he breaks the bread, he disappears, and they realize who he is. Now, nothing really could be much clearer than that, than that the sacraments are the place where we see Jesus and show him forth. 
And so there is a visible word. God addresses men in the sacraments, which are the heart and really the only absolutely essential thing in our ritual. And then third, God addresses men through the exercise of discipline, through the judgments that are manifested through the sword and through excommunication. Now, we spent all 45 minutes last week talking about this, so I, most of you were here and you remember that. These are the three ways God comes and addresses man in the church, structuring discipline, the sacraments, and preaching, teaching of the word. And this gives us the primacy of the word. Always the dialogue of truth is in terms of the word of God. The word of God read from God to you, the word of God taught, the word of God preached, the word of God made visible, the word of God sprinkled upon you in baptism, the word of God embodied in a lifestyle uh, as we live in the presence of one another. Sometimes you feel like you're convicted by the better life that somebody else leads. That's a way God communicates truth to you. Very real. Then the other part of the dialogue of worship is that man returns speech to God. And again, what we say back to God must be in conformity to his word. The Bible shows us what things are. We hear the word of God. We sing the word of God. Our prayers should be patterned after the word of God. Uh, much of them must be, should be uh, actual Bible passages and phrases. Uh, we eat the word of God in the sacrament. Uh, we receive and say back to God. Now, usually in the church, except where there's not much understanding of uh, in, in, in our tradition, there's not a whole lot of understanding of this type of thing. But if you were in Calvin's Geneva, Calvin would say that whenever the minister speaks to you, he stands here behind the pulpit. When he's reading the Bible, when he's preaching, this is where he stands. But when he speaks for you and addresses God, then he stands behind the table. So that there's a difference, uh, there's a difference between praying, which is man talking to God, and preaching, which is God talking to man. Preaching is conducted from the pulpit, Praying, which man speaks to God, is conducted at the table. That's just a way of dramatically highlighting the difference between these two parts of worship. But that's what worship is. That's all it is. And we'll talk about the kinds of speech or the kinds of manifestations of the word we have, what we call performative utterances, and we'll get to that in future weeks. But that's what worship is. It is a dialogue between God and man, a particular kind of dialogue. So in terms of the regulation of worship, the Bible gives us the basic regulation in these three areas. The Bible tells us what to do, do this in remembrance of me, how to structure our lives, how to structure the service under the governors, and what to teach and what to hear and what to say back. The primacy of the word, then, is the basic regulation of worship. Now, we haven't said, as we must say, what kinds of specific kinds of things are in the Bible, that is, what the patterns are, and we'll get to those patterns uh, as we move along. But the fundamental principle is we do only what the Bible teaches us to do in worship. Worshiping in truth. Truth in that whole sense. Now third, let's look at the context of worship. We worship in spirit. Let's look back at John 4. And if you haven't turned there, I really wish you would at this point because it's important for you to see what's being said here. John 4, starting in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say, In Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. This is the Samaritan woman. Now notice that the issue here is the location where worship is conducted. It's the environment which has been established. The Samaritans believed that God had constituted this particular mountain as the proper environment or place of worship where the angels would meet with men. And she says, but you Jews say, in Jerusalem is the place where God has put his name. That's where the environment has been set up. That's where the temple is established, and that is where men ought to worship. Now Jesus says to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. In other words, Jerusalem was the right place, and this mountain is not. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, 
the context sets it up for you, you see, that the expression in the spirit is basically an idea of place or environment. Where is appropriate worship conducted? Only in the spirit. Now, where is the spirit located then? Is a spirit located in Jerusalem or in this mountain or wherever two or three are gathered together? Well, wherever two or three are gathered together in the New Covenant age. Uh, but the point that's being spoken of here is that the expression worship in the spirit is speaking of an environment, and that environment is the New Jerusalem, which we saw in Hebrews 12, and which we'll look at in just a minute. Now, our Greek background leads us to think something else about the expression in spirit, so we need to take that into consideration. Some would say that worshiping in the spirit means we worship only in the inner man, that is, only in mental and internal motions. Uh, external activity is unimportant. But that isn't true to the Bible at all. Um, the Bible is the whole person, internal and external, individual and corporate, which worships God. Uh, some would say also, using the same type of thing, that worshiping in spirit means worshiping enthusiastically, uh, working yourself into a state where you really want to worship God. Well, that's very important, but that's not what the expression worshiping in spirit means. Basically, those two interpretations build on the idea that worshiping in spirit means worshiping in my spirit, worshiping in your spirit. You should get your spirit right and worship God. But in context, that won't work. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. The spirit spoken of here is the Holy Spirit. So worshiping in the Holy Spirit means worshiping where the Holy Spirit is. The God-ordered and God-ordained environment created by the Holy Spirit. Shall I say that again? The God-ordered and God-ordained environment created by the Holy Spirit. Now that is the New Jerusalem which came from heaven to the earth on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit came and created the environment for worship. That's what worshiping in the Spirit means, worshiping where he is. He comes out of heaven and creates the environment. And that environment is described for us in Hebrews 12. So why don't we look there and examine the passage a little bit more because it tells us quite a bit about uh, what worshiping in the Spirit is and how we should think about that. Now, there's a contrast here, an unspoken contrast. We can bring our own terminology between worshiping in the law and worshiping in the Spirit. And the worshiping in the law is set forth in verses 18 and following. It's very clear in Greek that there's a list of seven things here. We'll read them. You have not come, one, to a mountain that might be touched, two, to a blazing fire, three, to darkness, four, and to gloom, five, and to a whirlwind, six, and to the blast of a trumpet, seven, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further words should be spoken to them. Okay? These are all the terrifying manifestations of God's law, which characterize the Pentecost of the Old Covenant. You know that God gave the law on the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament. And when God gave the law on the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament, 3,000 people died. You remember that. They worshiped the golden calf. 3,000 died. Now, when the Holy Spirit came in the New Covenant Pentecost, it says 3,000 were saved. It's very careful how the Bible sets these things up. The problem is not the law. The problem is human sin. And when the Spirit hadn't come because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, the Spirit cannot come until Jesus is glorified. You're familiar with that phrase in John. The Spirit hadn't come in the Old Covenant, and so when God manifested his kingdom to them, it was terrifying. It was dark, and there was a whirlwind, and there was a blazing fire, and it was so terrifying that even Moses, the most holy man of you could imagine, said, I am full of fear and trembling. Now, by contrast with the coming of the Holy Spirit, we have a different environment for worship. And just as there were seven things listed for the Old Covenant worship, let's see how many things are listed here. Now, I'm going to go strictly by the Greek, and your English translation is in error at one significant point. Let's read it carefully here in verse 22. You have come, one, to Mount Zion, two, 
to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Three, to myriads of angels in festival array. Now, yours says to myriads of angels and to the general assembly in church, but that is not what it says in Greek. There's nothing, the uh, phrase general assembly means festival assembly, and it goes with angels and not with church. If you saw it in Greek, uh, the word and separates these things, and it, the, the order is very clear. You have a, a traditional mistranslation here which keeps being maintained uh, for tradition's sake and not in the interest of the text. This is not terribly important to us this morning. The third thing listed, though, is the myriads of angels in festival assembly. Fourth, the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Five, to God the judge of all. Sixth, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, that is, the righteous dead. Seven, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant. And eight, to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So in the new covenant you have eight, an eightfold thing. You move from seven to eight which is moving from a Sabbath day to a resurrection day, and eight being the new covenant number, it's appropriate. Now, this is the environment created by the Holy Spirit who comes out of heaven and creates this. He is the one who brings the myriads of angels in festival assembly and enables them to be in our presence. I don't want to do this this morning because it's very lengthy and involved, but you could go through the Bible and you would find that when the Bible talks about that glory cloud that we talk about from time to time in here, all the angels are present in it and God's throne is in the middle, that environment is created by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who orders all the other spirits, the other angels, around the throne of God. And so when God comes into our midst, he creates that environment with myriads of angels. And it also says the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That's all of you. Your baptism enrolls you in heaven. If you rebel, your name may be stricken from the book of life, as we've seen, but right now your baptism enrolls you in heaven. That's the way I interpret it. I'm not going to get into a fight about it. I think that can be proved. God, the judge of all in the midst, the spirits of righteous men made perfect, the righteous dead. They're also here present when we worship. We don't talk to them. We don't pray to them, but they're here just as the angels are here. They're watching. They're not asleep. Uh, they're not oblivious to what's going on. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. That's the environment that's created. That has certain architectural implications, which we will not get into. But it uh, does give us the environment. Now notice how the dialogue of worship is taken up right away. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. See, this dialogue of worship then is set up. God speaks to us in the visible word, and uh, more pointedly, more familiarly in the preaching and teaching of the word. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that is Moses, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. That's Jesus. He's ascended into heaven. Now he sends the Holy Spirit. He warns us from heaven. Back then his voice shook the earth. Verse 26. But now he has promised, and here again I have to translate literally, Yet a little while, and I will be shaking. That's in what's called present tense in Greek, and it means a continual shaking. He shook the earth once back at Sinai, but now in the New Testament age, the shaking is going to go on and on and on. He keeps shaking, not only the earth, but also the heaven. Shakes out the wicked angels, Satan and his bad angels. And this expression, yet a little while, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So this shaking is going to keep going until Christians are triumphant in the earth. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. That is, now this is our part in worship. He speaks, now we respond. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God, this is worship, an acceptable service with reverence and fear. The environment created by the Holy Spirit is one of reverence and fear. Worshiping in spirit and in truth, worshiping with an understanding of the new covenant environment, and worshiping in fear. For our God is a consuming fire, not was, is. He continues to be, and that must qualify everything we do. Now that points to sacrifice and the offering of ourselves. Let us offer to God an acceptable service, and he is a consuming fire. Implication pretty clear that we offer it and he takes it. So, we can move 
Notice how skillfully I've organized this lesson. When we looked at the purpose of worship, we find that uh, it means that we have to worship as God requires, and so that led us to the regulation of worship. And uh, that regulation of worship led us to talking about the context of worship. And now the context of worship leads us to talk about the essence of worship, which is sacrifice. And that is set out in Romans 12, verse 1. Christians are triumphant in the earth. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. That is, now this is our part in worship. He speaks, now we respond. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God, this is worship, an acceptable service with reverence and fear. The environment created by the Holy Spirit is one of reverence and fear. Worshiping in spirit and in truth, worshiping with an understanding of the new covenant environment, and worshiping in fear. For our God is a consuming fire, not was, is. He continues to be. And that must qualify everything we do. Now that points to sacrifice and the offering of ourselves. Let us offer to God an acceptable service and he is a consuming fire. Implication pretty clear that we offer it and he takes it. So, we can move. Notice how skillfully I've organized this lesson. When we looked at the purpose of worship, we find that uh, it means that we have to worship as God requires, and so that led us to the regulation of worship. And uh, that regulation of worship led us to talking about the context of worship. And now the context of worship leads us to talk about the essence of worship, which is sacrifice. And that is set out in Romans 12, verse 1, a passage we're all familiar with. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Okay? Without even going into all the details, the one thing that's clear is, in worship, the very essence and heart of it is to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice. We don't get killed in the process. Christ has done that for us. Now, how do we understand this theologically? What does the whole Bible have to say about it? Well, originally man was created to come before God and offer himself to God with his works. Man was created without any works. God had already done the work of creating the world. God had set it all up. And he put man in it. Man received it all as grace. Then man was to build, in terms of God's pattern, extend that pattern out, following the four rivers to the four corners of the earth, broadening that pattern out, learning and understanding, and then bring himself and his works before the throne of God as a sacrifice, not a blood sacrifice, but as an offering, let's say an offering. I think that's clearer in our language. But when man fell, his works were no longer acceptable because he was no longer acceptable. A man's works are what come out of himself. He has children and he builds cities. Those are the two things. Ray has talked about that. Remember what Cain did when he left the presence of the Lord? He had a son and he named his son Enoch. He built a city and he named the city Enoch. Name them the same thing. Man's works proceeding from himself. So when man is defiled, all his works are defiled. His children are defiled, and that's why they have to be baptized. His city is defiled, and that's why it has to be destroyed and replaced by the New Jerusalem. Now man and his works are no longer acceptable. And so we say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We have to come into the presence of God and remind him of Jesus' sacrifice by confessing our sins and receiving assurance of faith. The first thing that has to happen is a confession of sins when we come into God's presence. And that gives us something about liturgical order. We'll see it set out in the Bible in just a minute. Then, having confessed our sins on the basis of Jesus' death, we can offer ourselves and our works. It's rather interesting, you know. We sing, Nothing in my hands I bring, and yet the Bible says in Exodus 34, verse 20, None shall appear before me empty-handed. So when the Bible says, you may never appear before me empty-handed, um, that seems to contradict our instinct to say that we can bring nothing to God. But it doesn't really, you see. On the basis of Christ's death, then we can offer ourselves and our good works. We become good. We don't become good and then offer ourselves. But on the basis of Christ's death, then ourselves and our works are acceptable. Our good works... Our sinful works are not, but we've already confessed those. 
And so the next thing in the liturgy is the offertory. And that's why, as I pointed out last week, we sing, uh, when we present our gifts to God, we also sing something about offering ourselves. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That has to do with offering oneself, and that's why traditionally that's been used in the offering uh, in, in many of the churches, I think, where they've reflected on this a little bit better. So that's why we switched that. It's not to say we'll never sing the doxology again, but we'll probably never sing it at that point in the service because it is not a hymn about offering oneself. It's more appropriate, say, at a place where the Gloria Patri would be as a substitute there or maybe at the beginning or the end of the service. But right now, we're not using it at all for the next several months. Uh, so we offer ourselves and our works. That corresponds to the whole burnt offering. And finally, uh, in the essence of worship, we have a meal with God at the tree of life. Having confessed our sins, dedicated ourselves and our works to God, we come before him and we receive a meal with God at the tree of life. That would have been the original pattern, coming every Sabbath day to the tree of life and having sacrament having food with God but Adam didn't get to have that he was cast out we do Jesus is our tree of life as the Bible teaches us now this order is set forth I want you to see it because it's important that we see it it's not neutral what order we do things in in worship if we do things in the wrong order we gradually train ourselves to think the wrong way and we saw last week that what we do do this in remembrance of me is a form of teaching and extremely important. In Leviticus chapter 9, please turn there, this order is set out very carefully and is an order that we, the church traditionally has observed and we seek to observe here. We seek to observe it carefully. Can't comment on everything here. The book of Leviticus is so full of references to basic ideas that you can kind of preach on it forever, as you may have noticed. But uh, I'm just kidding. Now. In uh, Leviticus chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now it came about on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, and he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a calf, a bull for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering, both without defect, and offer them before the Lord. Then to the sons of Israel you shall speak, saying, Take a male goat for a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both one year old without defect for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, with a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord shall appear to you. Notice this is the eighth day. I find this very interesting theologically that uh, all of this seems to happen on the day of the Lord, the day after the Sabbath. Verse 6 verse 5, So they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the whole congregation came near and stood before the Lord in the very presence of God. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Come near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, that you may make atonement for yourself and for the people. Then make the offering for the people that you may make atonement for them just as the Lord has commanded. So, first of all, Aaron has to offer an atonement for himself and for his sin, and then he consecrates himself with the burnt offering. Now, once, now that Aaron is clean and pure, then he takes the sin offering for the people, confesses their sin, and the burnt offering for the people and consecrates them, and then they can come, and the third have a peace offering, which is a fellowship meal, always a communion meal. Let's watch him do it. Verse 8. So Aaron came near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And Aaron's sons presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put some on the horns of the altar and poured the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. The fat and the kidneys and the lobe of the liver of the sin offering. He then offered up in smoke on the altar, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin, however, he burned with fire outside the camp. Okay, and all of that is significant. We've looked at, um, Ray has taught us the significance of it uh, at various points. We, we're running out of time, so I don't want to get into it all. Then he slaughtered, after the sin offering, he slaughtered the burnt offering. Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around the altar. 
And they handed him the burnt offering in pieces with the head, and he offered them in smoke on the altar. He also washed the entrails and the legs and offered them up in smoke with the burnt offering on the altar. Okay? So the whole thing goes up. That's the consecration of the whole person. The sin offering, some of it's burned as acceptable punishment for God, and some of it's taken outside the camp, and all these different things point to the work of Christ as our sin offering. Then the whole man consecrates himself to God in the burnt offering. And now he does it for the entire nation. Then, verse 15, then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering, which was for the people, and slaughtered it and offered it for sin, like the first. Then he also presented the burnt offering and offered it next to the ordinance. Offered it to the ordinance, according to the ordinance. Next, he presented the grain offering and filled his hand with some of it and offered it up in smoke on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning. Now, what's the grain offering? It represents works. The whole man and his works are put on the altar. The grain offering always goes, or cereal offering always goes with the burnt offering. So first, confession of sin, then the consecration of the people and their works. Whole burnt offering and grain offering. Verse 18 then he slaughtered the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people. And Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he sprinkled it around on the altar. As for the portions of fat from the ox and from the ram, the fat tail, the fat covering, the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver, they now placed the portions of fat on the breasts and offered them up in smoke on the altar. That's food for God. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron presented as a wave offering before the Lord, just as Moses commanded. Now, a wave offering means... Let's say that the altar is right here. These things are taken and waved to God and then received back from him. So everything is given to God, but then God gives it back to eat. Same is true of the heave offering. The heave offering, the heavier piece, is taken and held up to God and then received back. So we could do that. In fact, many churches do when we receive the, uh, commun- the offering in the morning. This could be held up all of it given to God, and then it's given back for the elders to use as they see fit. God doesn't actually take it into heaven. He gives it back for our use. Sim- there, were, there were spats over all gestures at the time of the Reformation, but they were over whether or not there was anything magical connected with it. There's no magic there. It's just a signet. It's just a symbol. Well, I was speaking of the uh, offering. But the elements would be the same. In the early church, the elements were held up as a heave offering and received back. Not as an act of consecration, but just following this pattern. It's not essential. Okay, so that gives us the pattern of the essence of worship, and that gives us sort of what we might call a bare minimum. In other words, an appropriate worship service would be minimally come together to confess sin, then dedicate ourselves, and then have a covenant meal. Now, where would the preaching come in? Well, the preaching comes in connection with the meal. That's where God talks to man. You'll notice that Jesus is always talking to people at meals in the New Testament. He preaches to the 5,000, and he feeds them, even though, and he feeds them on the basis of the fact that they were all circumcised. In fact, the order is reversed. In one place, he, he feeds them all, and then he starts talking about how they have to eat his body and drink his blood, and it says many didn't follow him anymore. So he feeds them first, and then, they, then he preached to them and drove a lot of them away. But the preaching and the uh, sacrament go together as part of the peace offering. It's because we have peace with God that we can sit down and be instructed by him and engage in the dialogue of preaching. The preliminaries, so to speak, are the sin offering, confession of sin, and the burnt offering of <coughs> consecration. Those would be the bare minimums. Now, we're not restorationists. We don't believe that just going back to the New Testament uh, solves all the problems in the church. We believe that God has given gifts to the church down through the ages. And so we're not interested in a bare minimum, but we are interested in sticking with exactly what the Bible says is the foundation of everything that we want to expand. Everything in the worship service has to be an expansion of these basic things and not a departure from them. That's the important thing to keep in mind. Uh, I'd also like to say one other thing because these tapes go out here and there. There is in the modern uh, liturgical 
interest, a great desire to go back to the early church, and they talk about how in the early church there was no confession of sin in the worship service. In fact, we had some people here in this church at one point uh, who believed the same thing, that because they were saved, they didn't have to confess sin anymore. They just come into God's presence and worship, dedicate themselves without going through, first of all, a ritual confession of sin. Uh, I believe that is wrong. It's true that in the some quarters of the very earliest church we don't have that, but that just goes to show again that God through the centuries has developed the worship of the church as he's developed everything else. And I believe it's far better when we come into God's presence to begin with a confession of sin, get that out of the way, so to speak, get our sin out of the way, and then worship him as we should. One other point I'd like to make And that is that when you look at 1 Corinthians 11 and the abuse around the Lord's table, you find that it's an abuse of this order. People came together and ate first instead of confessing sin and dedicating themselves first. That was understandable since these were Gentile Christians. But Paul immediately goes to them and tells them to observe some type of proper order. And I think that the point of that is that observing these types of orders and sequences, doing these things, even if we don't always understand them, creates a mindset which is far more receptive to preaching, preaching of the truth, than uh, not doing them. So that, again, ties in with what we said last week, the way these forms of pedagogy reinforce one another. But it is interesting that uh, here this this error in Corinth can be tied in directly to a non-observance of proper liturgical sequence. They didn't see any need to confess sin. Uh, They just come together and eat. And uh, that attitude also manifested itself in the contempt that they showed toward other Christian brethren. All of these things were kind of a package. So I hope that helps explain what we do here. Just in closing, our morning worship service starts with a confession of sin. We have preaching. We have uh, sort of the climax of the morning service is the offering where we offer ourselves and our gifts. The evening service, since we come back together again, we confess sin again, and we go to the peace offering or the sacramental form of worship. But we're following this sequence in the worship that we have. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you manifest yourself to us in many different ways. We thank you for the Bible and for the Reformation that puts it back in our hands, helps us to discipline our lives in accordance with your will, and helps us to understand your truth so much better. We ask that you bless all of our preaching and hearing that we do today and help us also to understand and see you present in our midst with the eye of faith and to experience this in an attitude of awe and fear and your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.